I would like to welcome Alison Langdon from the Today Show, um, who's kindly come across today to um, start our Kind July conversations. And the first interview today is, is with Cheria Pitt, um, who's in Port Douglas, I understand, today. So good to see you, Cheria. <laughs> Um, Stay Kind is about um, all Australians being kind to each other. We have 25 million Australians and if we all did one act of kindness every day for the whole year, that would be 9 billion acts of kindness in Australia, which would be a fantastic thing. We also celebrate Kind July and um, I've known Alison now for 10 years and I've known Churia probably for about 9 years. And um, our eldest son Thomas was killed in King's Cross in July 2012 and then our younger son, Stuart, took his life in July 2016. So we thought we need to have more kindness, so we'll use the month of July as a month of kindness, and which we've called Kind July. <clears throat> and we invite everyone to get involved. If you go to our website, staykind.org, and you can register for Kind July and do the Kind July Challenge, which means doing an act of kindness every day and a whole bunch of other really great things. But um, without any further ado, because I know you all want to hear Cheria and what she's been up to, um, it's very hard to, um, to track Cheria all the time because she's so busy. Um, so thanks so much, both of you, for agreeing to do this interview today, and we're looking forward to it. Absolute pleasure. And just before you go, Ralph, too, because, yeah, I mean, I met you 10 years ago, probably one of the worst times in your life. And for what you and Cathy have done and what you've gone through and just absolute powerhouses in wanting to in wanting to change our society, in wanting to change our society for the best and for wanting to ensure that no other family goes through what you guys went through. This is a passion project for you guys and I honestly think you're changing conversations in this country and you're changing lives in this country and I just want to say a very, very big thank you for thank the you. extraordinary work that you've done for the past 10 years. Thanks, Alison. It's really kind of you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank and you. we love Taria. So Taria, I mean, you know, I think we're all a little a little annoyed that you're in Port Douglas where it's sunny and the fact that you're in a t-shirt and we're all rugged up in winter coats down here in summer. How are you going? Um, I'm going good and I'm really, I feel really honoured that Ralph asked me to be part of this today mm -hmm. um, because I first met Ralph and Kelly um, Ralph and Kathy, I, I I actually can't remember, but it was it was years ago, and we did a sixty minute segment together, um, and I really got to know them over that weekend, and so much admiration for those two, and you know I feel like with my journey, I've tried to make what's happened to me um, have a purpose, or I try to help other people, and I think Ralph and Kathy do that on a much, much bigger scale. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, inc they're an incredible couple. So thank you, Ralph. That's my way of saying thank you. Yeah, it's good. I remember that story that you guys did with 60 Minutes, and it's actually how I met both of you, right, was um, um, filming stories for 60 Minutes over the years. And I love that we've stayed in contact. I like that I both call you guys friends now. Um, and, and you've both changed my life for the better and uh, in a way that, you know, I think both of you... Um, well, I said both of you, when I say Ralph, I'm talking about Ralph and Kathy as well as Taria. So the three of you um, have made me want to be a better person and try to be a better person. So, I mean, it's Stay Kind Month, Taria, and it's really important to you. So the first question would be, what have you done that has been kind today? Well, hold on, isn't it? Is it Stay Kind July? Yeah, well, you know, yeah, well, yeah, but yeah, that's right. We're not in July yet, are we? <laughs> Okay, so are you saying you're not going to be kind until the 1st of July? <laughs> I'm just going to be a total bitch until the 1st of July. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I think this is what's really good about this activity, right? It kind of reframes your headspace and makes you focus on doing those little acts of kindness that you can do for, for other people. And I think so often we get so caught up in our minds so caught up with our to-do list and everything we've got to get done and all of that stuff that we almost forget mm. to show kindness to other people, to show kindness to strangers. Um, and my kind act was there was a lady at my kid's preschool um, who was asking me about the vitamins that I use because I'm supposed to buy a vitamin brand, and so I dropped some off to her. So that was oh. my that was, Yeah. 
Nice. See, you were kind today. And when you, it's little things, right? Um, and you look to over like the last couple of years that we've that we've had, right? It's little things. Like I gave a mate of mine a buzz who's um, she's a single mum. She's at home with two little girls, and they've all finally got caught COVID. And she's sick as a dog, and the girls are sort of feeling fine. And I just think, oh my goodness, you know. They're in an apartment, she's feeling like she can barely leave, you know, and, so, and there's not much you can do, right? So it's little things like a knock on the door, drop something at the front door and a phone call or a check-in. You know, it doesn't always yeah. have to be, I think when we're, when we're doing something in regards to kindness, some sort of, some big act. I think sometimes yeah. just um, checking in on someone is enough. And I think for me, like when I was recovering in hospital, um, you know, with people who did those little things that you just said, like a mate dropped off a USB full of heaps of movies and TV series for me to watch. Um, like friends would drop off home-cooked meals. Um, those sort of little acts of kindness, uh, they really mean a lot to the person who's going through something hard. Mm. It makes them feel like people care, people haven't forgotten, that people um, want the best for them. And so I always say, like, if you know someone who's going through something really hard, whatever that hard thing is, right, whether they're getting divorced or they've got a cancer diagnosis or whatever it is, just showing up for them in those little ways, um, leaving a handwritten card at their front door, dropping off a couple of meals. Um, you know, if they're a parent, you can offer to look after their kids, take their kids to the park on a Saturday, just give them a little bit of time out, all of those little things. And I feel like most of us are inherently really kind, really good people. Most of the world is. Uh, but we probably just forget with our busy lives to to make space for other people and to show them that little bit of kindness as well. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. Look, and you just touched on it then, um, that time that you spent in hospital. And look, look, I think everyone knows your story, right, Taria? And um, but just as a very, very quick background, of course, you were competing in an yeah. ultra marathon um, in the Kimberley in WA. It was back in 2011 yeah. when you got caught in that grass fire. 65% um, burns to your body and ended up in hospital and in a really bad way where, you know, there was talk that maybe you wouldn't survive. Everyone underestimated well, you know, not everyone underestimated. Those who knew you never underestimated you. But I want to go to the kindness element in this because I was reading something um, that you wrote um, a little while back, maybe even been in your book, I think, where you talked about how you tried to push Michael, your partner, away in yeah. that time. Um, and, and he was a guy who just turned up every single day. You're telling him to get lost and what have you. Just talk us through that story. And, and, the, and the fact that he stuck with you, what that meant to you? Yeah, I mean, I always, like, we had a, we had a fight this morning um, about, because he, he does this really annoying thing where he puts the clothes in the washing machine and he goes, I've washed all the clothes. And then I'm like, but you haven't because now I have to hang them out and then <laughs> fold them and then put them out. Just like, just the normal domestic, the d domestic bickering that happens um I think in hospital I felt I, there was a part of me that felt really guilty that um all of these people that I really loved that their lives were put on hold and I felt I felt guilty that Michael was there because I was like this guy's like nothing's happened to him he's young he can keep living his life he can meet someone else and all of that type of stuff and I think what Michael demonstrated to me was that if you are if you just show up for someone, doesn't mean you have to do anything extraordinary, just show up, just be there for them, be consistent, be reliable, be someone that they can trust. Um, I think all of those little things really say a lot about someone. And so I agree with you, Ali, it's not about those massive extraordinary gestures of romance or um, adulation, it's more about just being, by, being with someone, being at their hospital every morning at 7 o'clock, reading a paper, um, mm. that type of thing, that's where, I think that's where you see someone's character. Yeah, I mean, Michael is one of the most amazing humans that I've ever met. And, um, and, I, and the thing about the washing, I totally get it. I don't, what is it? What is it? It's just like chucking something in and thinking that's the washing done. I it's mean, not done. That ain't done. kind. No. That's, I'm with you. That's just annoying. <laughs> 
And it's a boy thing, right? Just to really do a really broad generalisation. Just like, yeah, I've done that, I've done that. No, but it's, it's, you know, it's only done when the washing is, like, put on the line, it's dried, it's folded, and then it's put away. Put away. Then you can say you've done the laundry. Yep. All, you know? all you're doing now is just showing us that your your relationship is very, very normal. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> we all go through this. So, look, what, what I love about your story, Taria, and I know like kindness is such a really big part of, of what you talk about, but another really big part is resilience. And so, yeah. and I think, I mean, you, you're a motivational speaker, and I remember even just from the very first time I met you, um, you were so strong. So strong that it is, you know, it's intimidating at times, right? Because there's, it's, it's, it's hard to understand your vulnerabilities because you don't show them very often. But I've wow. noticed of late that you are sharing more of that stuff. And I wonder yeah. what, what that is about, about now or in, say, like the past sort of 12 months or so where you feel you can share more of that. I think, so probably when I first met you, Ali, it was probably kind of recent after my accident. And yeah. so I think it was a protective mechanism, right, because at that time I feel like if I was really vulnerable then I would have just collapsed, I would have lost it, I wouldn't have been able to pick myself back up. So I almost tried to put on this this brave face Um and tried to assume this persona of someone who was really strong and brave and all of those things, even though at the time I didn't feel like I was any of those things. And I, st I still don't feel like I'm any of those things. And I think what I've learned over the years, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I did, I did Iron Man. I did Iron Man. I did one Iron Man, and Iron Man is like, you know, the epitome of endurance events. So it's a, Four kilometre swim and a hundred and eighty kilometre bike ride, and then a marathon, which is forty-two kilometres. So I did one. And I then did I that yesterday, to... actually, and I've got. To say, I was pretty tired by the end. I was no. so I was so tired, but you know that was that it was fun. I had some dinner and then got up, went to work early this morning. So I totally get it. Yeah, my last ultra. Yeah. I, I, it's really great that you understand yeah. what an endurance athlete goes through. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your um, for your empathy, Ali. <laughs> um, oh, I got tired walking up the stairs today. In fact, it wasn't even stairs, it was the lift. I got tired catching the lift. <laughs> well, and then I did, I, then I got invited to do Ironman World Championships, which is, you know, Ironman on a really big stage, and I did that. And then I got invited to go to the premiere event of, because I did a documentary about me, right, when I did the Ironman World Championships. So I, I flew to New York, I, fl I was excited for the event, I left my hotel room, I was all like, you know, dressed up, ready for this party. And I walked across the road, to the subway and as I was walking down the subway steps I realized that I had forgotten my FPOS card in my hotel room and I just had 20 bucks cash and maybe for you Ali you'd think sweet easy I'll just pay cash doesn't matter but for me I started to get really nervous because my hands are badly damaged by the fire so I always feel really awkward um, handling small pieces of change so I started getting nervous and I was like, oh, okay, I don't have a choice because I'm running late for this event, so I'm just going to have to pay for pay with cash. And I line up in the queue and I can hear the, the ticket seller man. He sounds like an arsehole because he's yelling at people for being in the wrong place and being in the wrong queue, having the wrong money, like starting to sweat because I know, like I know what's going to happen. I know what this interaction will entail. So I come up with this idea that after I get my, after I get my subway ticket, I'll just smoke bomb. Right, I won't hang around to get my change. So when I'm at the front of the queue, I ask him politely for a pass to Midtown. When I give him my twenty dollar note, for me because I don't have the right amount of money, and I just smile. And he gives him my subway pass and starts to count back the change. But it's at that point where I just smoke bomb. I, I leave because I don't want to extend the interaction any more than I need to. And he starts yelling at me. He says, come back here, lady. This guy was not kind, by the way. He was not a kind man. But he was saying, yeah, come back here, lady. I don't want your goddamn change clogging up my goddamn desk. And I just, like, I'm really flustered and, you know, like, what the fuck's going on? So I 
you know, I, I go back to the to the ticket booth and I say really politely, um, mate, I'm really sorry, but I can't physically get the change. Um, yeah. Is it all right if if you just keep it? And that just sends him off even further. He starts screaming at me even louder, going, I don't give a goddamn who to make this goddamn change. I don't want your goddamn change. And I feel so, like, so flustered and so ridiculed by this one interaction that I start to cry. Busy subway station. I'm surrounded by all of these strangers. And I start to cry. And I think for me, you know, I've done this really amazing, really amazing achievement mm. that my able-bodied people wouldn't be able to do. I competed in my World Championships, right? I was on a high. But at that moment, it felt like all of the work, all of the training, all of the effort I had done up to that point was futile because I I was just unable to do this ordinary mundane task of getting my ticket, getting my change for my subway ticket. And so, you know, sharing stories like that, letting people know what I can't do or what I'm not able to or what I'm not capable of doesn't feel very good. Doesn't, it's not very good for the ego to say that I can't get change or I can't, you know, do up buttons of a shirt or I have, you know, I have trouble, um, you know, with a dress, I have trouble doing my bra or taking my dress or whatever it is. Um, but what I've found, and this has come with experience, is that when I'm vulnerable, when I share when I share parts of me that um, I'm ashamed of or I'm a little bit embarrassed about, it not only resonates with people, but it makes me realise that I that I don't actually have anything to be ashamed of. And yeah. if I can't do up buttons, who cares? You know, but I think that process has only come with learning. Um, but I just wanted to finish off that subway story because even though the ticket seller was not a kind of man, he obviously had um, something going on in his life, yeah. um, there was a really kind human being who saw that I was upset and he walked over to me and he said, what's wrong, darling, what's wrong? And I said, this this arsehole's yelling at me. You know, I was in a real panic state. So he scooped up all of the change and he put it in my coat pockets and then he said, where are you going? And I told him and he caught the subway with me and oh, made wow. sure I got to that. Oh, I know, oh. he was like a really beautiful human being. So there we go. There I'm are glad the story ended like people. that because I really didn't like that at the other bloke and I kept waiting for him to have, I was hoping the other guy was going to have that moment where he turned into the kind person and there's a couple of people in the room like oh. me right now who are all teary listening to that because it is, yeah, no, like, I know. don't you reckon like that's, that's perhaps a person who doesn't even remember that, that he turned around and helped you and like maybe that's a person that that was just something they did that day and they've gone on but that is something that you've remembered. And that is what you take yeah. away from that story, not the asshole, but the but that act of kindness. And that's the power of being kind, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, you know, when you're in the car, letting someone, you know, when you're driving along and you're like someone wants to come in and you're like, ah, oh, all right, come on, come on in, mate, you know. Like that's an act of kindness. I think being kind to our own families. Yeah. I know in my list of priorities, Michael often falls all the way down, um, you know, because as a mum, your kids are first and you work and running the household and I think you forget to show um, that kindness or that attention or that love towards your partner. So that's something that I try and do, yeah. often forget. I often yeah. forget. And, um, and I get that, right, because you're, you know, yeah. everyone's, everyone's just, and you touched on it in the very beginning, everyone's really busy. Um, you like we've got kids similar age. We've got two little kids. You're working. There's a whole lot kind of going on. You sometimes, it's almost um, that you take those closest to you for granted, don't you? Like, oh, that's fine. They're oh. gonna be fine. You can kind of park that and and um, and what have you. So I think that's a really nice lesson that you're sharing there. Um, I'll just to tell you too, Taria, that we've got um, people writing in um, a whole bunch of questions. So as they come oh, in, I'll throw a few to you. Um, if you're at home watching, um, and I had a whole bunch of mates reach out to me going, oh my gosh, I hear that you're talking to Taria, so they've all tuned in. So I say hi to them, my old mates from school. Um, but um, I'm going to go to this one too, because um, Jules has just written in to say, how do you stay so positive? I don't think I'm a positive person. Um, 
I think I'm a realist. So I feel like, and I, I almost feel there's a bit of a culture of toxic positivity these days where we where we have to put a positive spin on things, find the silver lining, pump ourselves up, be energetic and motivated and, and like, you know, yes, 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 all the time. And I don't, I, I don't, well, that's not my life anyway. Like some days I feel good, feel excited, feel happy. Other days I might have a fight with Michael in the morning. My kids might be dawdling when I'm trying to like get them in the car because I've got to drop them because I've got to start my day. And so rather than having this aim of always being happy and positive, if I feel sad or I feel annoyed or I feel irritated or I feel resentful, Rather than pushing those feelings to the side and saying, I don't want to feel like that, I'm not going to feel like that, I just allow myself yeah. to, you know, if I present like Michael, I just allow myself to feel feel that and kind of process that internally because I feel like our emotions are trying to tell us something um, and even though it's not comfortable, if we just allow ourselves to be stressed or angry or irritated, for me in my experience, that emotion dissipates a lot quicker. I think with being positive, you can definitely help to cultivate maybe a more resilient mindset yep. and resilience about accepting, you know, the, the good and the bad in your life and knowing that whatever life throws your way, you have inner resources to be able to cope with that. And I think what helps me with, with cultivating that is I try and think of what I'm grateful for um, and I try to do that every morning, right? And I'll think of really specific things. So I'm grateful to to Michael because he finished work early yesterday and came to soccer with us and we had a good afternoon with the kids down at the Oval, um, being grateful for a team member at work for doing a really good job on a project, grateful for my mum because I forgot a whole heap of shit down in Aladala mm-hmm. and she posted it up to us. And I think just about the people in your life that you're grateful for, why you're grateful for thinking of really specific examples. Um, I know it puts me in a better state of mind because rather than thinking about, you know, me, me, me and listening to your head noise and thinking about your process, you're kind of flicking that and thinking about the other people in your life. And I think that also is a good way to show kindness, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting you they're talking about like, you know, that circle that you've got and you've got Michael, your, your partner, you've got your beautiful mum. Gosh, I love your mum. Um, and and I think, you know, even the, the people that you work with, um, you sort of, you treat as family and as friends. Like it's a pretty close group and close knit group that you've got there. Um, you were talking earlier then about, um, and this is going back a little bit, um, about sort of that feeling of being alone and why, and in those earlier days and for that sort of first almost what really seven, eight years of, of just having to be that brave face, maybe not quite that long, that brave face and, and, and just give out that persona. Did you ever, were you letting your guard down with those closest to you or was that up even with them? I think... The answer to that question, Ali, would depend on the day because, and I'm sure Ralph and Kathy can relate to this, it's that feeling of just because you've gone through something awful or harrowing, that doesn't mean you still can't feel joy in your days. And that's a really hard thing for us to reconcile, right? And so I went through this catastrophic accident and then I rebuilt my life and I'd have days where I still felt sad about what had happened, but I would find myself laughing at something funny on a TV show. I would find myself having a quick catch up with my friends and I would feel happy. Um, I might be with Michael and I might let him know how I was feeling and feel really sad and, and have this outburst of emotions, but then the next day we'd have a really good day together and go surfing and go down the beach. So I think it's that it's that knowledge that how you feel isn't a permanent state. Yeah. So if you feel sad today, that doesn't mean you might feel sad tomorrow. It doesn't mean you'll feel sad the next day. And if you feel happy or excited or joyful, like go with that feeling. Yeah. Um, Embrace it, relish it, and 
Um, because I don't, I think the good feelings don't last, but the bad feelings don't last either. Yeah. And that's how I've tried to, yeah, tried to, tried to um, look at look at the past ten years of my life. And I, I think that's something good to talk about because I think um, I think when the bad times are, when, you know, when, when you're in that headspace at times. And, you know, just sort of looking around the room here if we, when we talk about this stuff, I think sometimes they can be so overwhelming that they feel like they're not going to end. And I think sometimes yeah. when we're enjoying the good times, you're waiting for the good times to end, but you think the bad times are not going to end. So, you know, how do you, how do you get yourself out of that mindset? Gosh, that's so hard. That is so hard. I think um, if you – if we think about it carefully, we all have – this bank of bank of times in our life where we have gone through something hard, um, and I think it can be really helpful to write a list. Um, it might sound like overkill for some people, but I'm a list writer. I love getting things down in, you know, on pen and paper. And so what I did with my I wrote a list of hard stuff that I'd done before in my past. So for example, I got bullied in year five. I was on a in a bus crash, um, and a child died. My parents got divorced, those types of things. And that, that was evidence or that was proof to me yeah. that I was resilient and I could cope with hard things because I'd gone through something hard previous in my life. I was still here and I was still okay and I was still coping. That gave me faith that I had the inner resources to be able to deal with this horrible thing that had happened. So I think that can be a useful exercise for people. Um, to help them understand it, resilient. Yeah, and this next question that has come in is kind of almost um, links to what you're saying there and writing lists and all. Um, the question's from Kylie and is, how important has self-talk been on your journey? I got really lucky, right? I had an amazingly positive mum and you've met her, Ali. Yeah. She's awesome. So as a kid, you know, if I said I can't do this, she'd say, no, darling, no, darling, you can't yeah. do it yet. Can't do it yet, you know. So she was. I didn't realize it at the time. I was just like, "Shut up, yeah. mum." And just oh, for anyone like, in the room, right? When you do meet Teresa's mum, you almost have to like strap yourself in. It's like, what just happened? It's like this burst of positivity and just like this. It's 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 an energy. It's a force that like you think Teresa's yeah. impressive. Meet a mum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ali, for telling me my mum is more impressive than me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's as impressive as you. All right. No one's more impressive yeah. than you, Tub. Okay. So, yeah, I got really lucky because she's really good at positive self-talk and as a kid she was always changing my language, you know. Um, if I ever said, oh, I have to do this, she'd say, no, 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 you get to do that. You get to do that. That's an opportunity. You're, you know, you're in a privileged position. So I think self-talk, obviously, really, really important. Um it is hard to know what you're saying to yourself, right, because most of our thoughts aren't very well articulated and it can just be an overwhelm, um, like feeling that we're getting in our heads without processing any of it at all. But just some really quick helpful word shifts might be, um, you know, rather than saying you can't do something, remind yourself that you can't do it yet. I think that reminds you that the state you're in isn't permanent. There is hope for improvement or hope that you can get better at whatever it is. And I think swapping up to with I get to, um, and I use that a lot at my first son, Huckabye, because I was always telling myself that I had to pick him up, had to clean his room, had to feed him, had to settle him. And yeah. by using that, it, it made me feel like I was resenting this, this beautiful baby boy. So then I started saying I get to, right, I get to play with my kids, I get to pick them up from school, I get to be around and watch them as I grow up and just by changing my language. Um, it shifted the focus from to being one of gratitude. Yeah. You've used, um, you've talked about this before, I know where you've said that you've been described as bossy and obstinate and that you shift that, right, to that means you're, you know, to being masterful and gritty. I remember, yeah. I remember reading that once and thinking, that's brilliant. Yeah, and I saw that played out during Celebrity Apprentice, right, because um, I felt like if some of the male cast members um, behaved in a certain way, 
it would be perceived that they were confident or that they knew what that meant. But if the female cast members were doing something very similar or doing something the same, we were perceived as being arrogant, bossy, um, you know, being a bit of an overlord, that type of stuff. So I think I really think our language is yeah. really important especially the language we use to describe ourselves and the language we use to describe our kids as well. Yeah. How did you find Celebrity Apprentice? Because I, I, I know that you were talking about it being this, um, you know, this, it was this great experience that you love doing. And I think we sit at home and look at it and it's, it's not always the most kind environment or it certainly doesn't seem <laughs> to be when you're sitting at home and watching it. Like it's it's pretty full on. It's competitive. You've got celebrities pitted against each other. Did you find kindness within the show? So I, my, my experience was so I made some really good friends with the other cast members. Some, some of the cast members, like Bronte Campbell, yeah. was amazing. Um, she's you know, a good was, chick, by the way. She's a, she's yeah, a good she's human a being. Yeah, she's a good actor. Like, most of the cast were really, really awesome and I've made, like, some really solid friendships from doing the show. Um, you came along to the golf day, Ali, which was... <laughs> the day was nuts. Yeah, it, it's a day that I don't that I don't want to ever remember. Um, <laughs> so I made some good, I really good friendships with some of the cast, um, but some of the other cast members I didn't find to be kind at all. I found them to be assholes. Um, so how do you deal and, with that then, right? So how, how do you how do you you find you find the people in your life who are kind and are great? How do you then deal with the assholes? Yeah, and this is the thing, right? Because if you if you met some of these people in the real world, um, if I was I, I just feel like I'm not going to be mates with them. I'm not going to spend my time with them uh, because they're you know they're a prick. They're a waste of time. Don't don't want to know them. But when you're working someone or if you're in a toxic workplace I don't know if anyone here um, has a boss who they find difficult to work with or have colleagues or have peers and I found during my time as an apprentice um, some of the people were not kind and were the opposite of kind yeah. um, how I dealt with it is I didn't say anything and I chose to just um, pretend that I was fine and just go along with it. And in retrospect, I wish I had called the behaviour out earlier because I did call it out. Yeah. But I think type of behaviour, that type of bullying behaviour, um, it doesn't go away. Instead, it just escalates. So in retrospect, I wish I had have called it out earlier. Yeah, and I think there's a whole discussion around that because, I mean, we've all seen where unkindness, a lack of kindness can where that shifts into bullying and all, and even if it's not directly, you know, directed at us, how how often we've perhaps been bystanders or have seen examples of it where, you know, is it then our responsibility to call that out, you reckon? I think it is. And, you know, from my time of the show, I had so much support from the rest of the cast. I had people who would stand up for me, who would support me, who would advocate for me. Um, you know, when this guy was was bullying me and being physically intimidating, people would say, that's not on, that's not true, that's inappropriate behaviour. So I did have all of that stuff occurring. And I definitely think, you know, you think about a stay kind foundation um, and about being kind to others. I think if you don't call out that bullying type of behaviour, if you don't call out that type of disrespect, yeah. then you're doing a disservice. And I think it's all of our responsibility, um, even more so if we're not the target, even yeah. more so to call it out and to call it when we see it. And I think I think we are seeing that shift now. I think it's sort of um, we've had this thing, and if you go back even 10 years, it was it was it was a similar thing we say domestic violence. It was like, oh, okay, well, that's not our business. We don't we don't talk about it. What happens behind closed doors? We've had a huge shift in how we talk about that, how we deal with domestic violence, and I think we're having that same conversation in regards to bullying. We don't just go, well, it's got nothing to do with us anymore. Um, we've got some more questions coming in. Also, if anyone in the room has any questions for Taria, just let me know, and we can throw them at her. Um, this one is from Elizabeth. What would you like people to do to be more kind in their everyday lives? 
I think like the kind July challenge is a really good one, right? Because um, you're, you're focusing on it um, and you have to be proactive with it. And you'll probably find over the month of July, you'll feel better about yourself because you're doing these really great things yeah. for other people. And I said great things. They don't have to be astronomical, right? It can be paying for someone's coffee, letting someone in in the car, writing a thank you note to someone. Like I love it when I get a thank you note in the mail. It, it sounds really old-fashioned, yeah. but it's a really good way of letting people know that you appreciate them. That's an act of kindness, cooking dinner for people. So I think to be kind, if it's something that you want to do, and I believe it's something we all need to do, we all need to start doing it, and we all need to do it more, um, participating in the Kind July Challenge and thinking of those acts of kindness that you can do on a daily basis, I think is a really good way to start. Yeah, because I think we've all been on the receiving end, right, of an act of kindness and how, like, how good does it make you feel? Like you're talking about the thank you note. It's not even so much the note. It's that you know that someone has gone to the effort to to write something, to deliver something. It's, it's the time like, and care you, that you know has gone into that. You think about all of those steps, buying a card, writing in it, putting in the envelope, getting a stamp. Like there is a lot there to send off a thank you note. So, and, and that's... It's kind of a simple thing that you can do to show someone how much they mean to you and how much you care about them. And I think so. I go. You go, Ali. No, you I go. Was just say, I was just going to say I'm going to I'm participating in the Stay Kind, Stay Kind July Challenge, and I'm going to incorporate thank you notes in mine because I I think I should send more of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, my address is. Um... <laughs> Email. Um, I wanted to go back to something you said at the very, very beginning. Um, and and I think it's something to, that's important for us all to remember too. I think most people are kind. And I think, I mean, especially, I work in media, right? So I, I also, you know, spend three and a half hours on air in the morning. So I'm part of the problem, you could say, where we talk about all the things that are wrong in this world. We talk about, you know, you certainly look over the last couple of years and it's been, it's, there's been lots of stuff that's been grim and hard to talk about. And, um, and I think sometimes in all of that, when we watch the news and we see what's going on, it is, it's very easy to forget most people, there are only a few real shitbags in the world. Most people are right. kind. And I think when we do kind things for others, we all feel good. Like we actually get something out of, out, out of that as well. And so I think what's really important when we, when we sort of focus on let's do kind things in, 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 in the month of July, and I think the whole sort of the premise behind it and what, you know, Kathy and Ralph hope will happen and the foundation hope to have come from it is that it doesn't just become a thing that happens in, it's in a July. It becomes something that we just innately do every day in our lives. It is important to remember that we are surrounded by good, kind people, isn't it, Taria? Yeah, it totally is. And I, I agree with you. Um, you are part of the problem. But you're also... <laughs> See, that's well, just you're, her that's being the realist job. that she is. I mean, she could put a bit of positivity well, on it, but no. <laughs> that, that, well, that is your job to report on the news. And the news is um, a lot of bad stuff that's happening in the world. And I find if I am tuned into the news all day and I found this during the fires and I found this with COVID, when you were looking at the numbers every day, that made me feel really shitty, yeah. down, disheartened, dispirited. And so I really think we have a choice as to what we tune into. And I found that during those times where it was so pervasive and, I, you know, it made me feel really despondent, I chose not to tune in. I chose not to turn on my TV because yeah. that just made me feel really shitty and things like doing an act of kindness for someone else that's something we do have control over because that's the thing I'm watching news all the time it makes you feel really powerless um but yeah. for the average person who is me um but we do have yeah, control yeah over. I agree I agree can do and I, and I know that we hit a point during you know because like we, Carl and I are coming in every morning and for that period of time you're like for three and a half hours, you can't escape it. And I would just go home and just like, I don't want to know anything about COVID. And then I'd sort of turn that side of my brain back on like at four o'clock in the afternoon. 
but we couldn't yeah. escape it. And I know that we just went, okay, let's shift out what this show, like, yeah, we've got to do this, this, this and this, but there are so many good things happening here. Let's, you know, and we actually, we really sought those positive stories in that time. They're hard to find sometimes, yeah. some days. But Yeah, and you guys do a really good, you guys do a great job with that on the Today Show. It is like you report on the news, the serious heavy stuff, but you also report on like really cute stories about a pet sheep that got entered into a shearing competition and the farmer won, you know. So like those Wait, sort of don't, stories. don't underestimate the cute, the cute animal stories. I mean, you know, they kept me going during COVID. Hey, look, we've only got a couple of minutes to go. I want to ask one more question that's come through. Um, and this theme has actually come through on a couple of questions. So how can youth, so how can young people take or make meaning from adversity? That is a hard question to answer. I found that I created meaning meaning from what happened to me by sharing my story. Um, and so I found that I'd share my story or I'd write my newsletters and I'd get emails back from people saying, oh, my gosh, I had something similar happen to me. Oh, oh my gosh, I can really relate to that. And so doing that, I love writing. I'm a bit of an introvert, um, probably why I live in far north Queensland. <laughs> I'm a bit of an introvert, so my the the favorite part of the favorite thing for me to do is write. I love writing. I love writing pieces of content that I put out there into the world, and then I get positive feedback from people. Sometimes negative, but mostly positive feedback from people who say it helped them a lot. It helped them with their own struggles. It helped them in their own lives. So I think if you're trying to figure out ways to find meaning from adversity, look at what Ralph and Kathy have done. Like they're doing it on a massive, massive stage. That's one way you can just write, but also just using your story in a way to help, you know, your friends and family and relationships around you. Yeah, and because I mean, I think one of the things about you, I think like where you've ended up and you do a lot of motivational speaking and all, it's all happened very organically. I don't feel that you ever sort of set out and that I'm going to do this, but it's just that the, the force of who you are, um, everyone who meets you loves you. Um, and even though Michael's sometimes scared of you, um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you're an extraordinary human being. And um, you, I mean, you inspire me. I know Ralph and Kathy are inspired by you. And I love how even, you know, how humble you are when you talk about your story, like, but this is, you know, this is what Kathy and Ralph are doing. And, and I'm just sort of over here. You are inspiring millions and millions of people. You're one of the best humans I've ever met. You've made me a better person. And how much, how appreciative are we that Taria has given up her time today to come on and talk about kindness and staying kind and just sharing her story. You're a legend. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Ralph. I'm happy. Thank you. Lovely. And a huge thank you, too, to Kathy and Ralph Kelly and to the Stay Kind Foundation. Remember, it is the month of July. So just share it amongst your friends. Spread the message. It's something that will make you feel good. It'll make the other person feel good. Um, and we can all be better, can't we? Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you. Come back up. Ralph's coming back up. Do I get off? Hey, Cherie, can you hear me? I can hear you, Ralph. Oh, look, I just want to um, ask you, did your mum send the Stay Kind costume, swimming costume up to you? You said she packed a whole load of clothes from a little dollar. <laughs> you can hear me? No, she didn't send it. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, OK, no, th just a joke. Um, I'm heading up next week. I'm going to see you next week up in Port Douglas, so I'll take it up for oh, you. Oh, thanks very much. It's go. an double though. Oh, it's okay, right? <laughs> take it up. I just wanted to say that um, we actually met um, the power of the media. Most people don't understand this, but um, with Alison in particular for our foundation, um, uh, 60 Minutes had an executive producer called Tom Malone, who's now with 2GB, heads up 2GB. And Tom um, understood the power of the media and, and the good that the media could do for not-for-profits. And he started to hold dinners for not-for-profits. And the first one he held was for the Daniel Morecambe Foundation, for Bruce and Denise Morecambe at the Hilton. And, Chura, that's where we met and um, that night. And um, we also met, um, obviously, Bruce and Denise. And so we've all become very good friends out of tragedies and trauma, unfortunately. Um, but those friendships are unbreakable. And um, Alison, in particular, for the foundation, 
Um, emceed one of our events where we had um, pre-cocktails with David and Linda Hurley at Government House when he was the Governor of New South Wales. And then we decided that we'd take all the guests on a, on a ferry and take them around to Darling Harbour. And um, Ali was the MC that night. I don't know if you remember this. You I probably do. do. You won't that. forget it. And it poured with rain as we walked down from Government House to the ferry at the Opera House. And we all arrived at the venue, which was being MC'd by Ali, completely drowned. And Ali yep. looked at me and said, I've never, I have my hair under the, um, under the, under under the, the hand, dryer, hand dryer, dunnies, yep. trying to dry my hair. So, um, the people in the media do, you know, like Alison, do amazing roles to support um, people like Chira and ourselves to get our messages out. Um, and they do it in their own time, in their own place. They rarely ever say no. They're always the first people to say, yes, I can do that. So I think we should recognise the media for the good that they do behind the scenes because it's really quite extraordinary. And um, so thank you, Alison. Um, but to the two of you today, um, to your amazing, amazing conversation, and thanks for the, all the questions. Um, I think we learned a lot about you. you know, every time you speak, I learn about you, Taria. So um, thank you for being so transparent and open and honest. It's, um, and it's great to see you again. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, th thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you.